uh, to get that started. There we go. All right, it has started. Um, so this particular meeting, we can certainly talk about lots of things, but I think as a, as a starter conversation, we were going to um, discuss, sorry, I'm just pulling it up here, <laughs> how things went this semester, um, what plans you have for next semester, given what you've either learned this semester or what you've, what you've been uh, doing this semester. Uh, and then we can maybe sort of broaden that out to how we, we being, you know, sort of the broader sort of pickup leadership uh, can help facilitate things in different ways. So uh, because Michelle is in the upper left-hand corner of my screen, Michelle, uh, could you please tell us how things went this semester for you and what you have planned? I noticed uh, it looks like the hackathon's coming together. Yes, it is. I'm super excited about it. And actually, finding funding was a lot easier than I expected, so that was good. Um, but in terms of computation in class, um, I think the update is the same as the last time we talked in that um, I had no um, pushback from students. They all responded like extremely enthusiastically to the um, addition of some basic Python where I don't ask them to write it from scratch, but to work with code and edit code um, in the lab portion of the second semester intro class. Um, the main issue was time on my part. So at the beginning of the semester, it was um, uh, going really well on for everybody. And then, um, then as the semester went on, it was more of a struggle for me um, to keep posting good content for them related to the work they were doing. Um, so, so yeah, that's pretty much how it went. So I, I mean, I'm really happy with the feedback on the computation part of the class. Um, I think for next, um, for upcoming semesters, I'm really debating next semester on whether or not I'm going to try to um, integrate computation the same way that we're, that I did this semester because I am teaching two new classes, so neither are the same. And one of them is computational physics, which I don't have any material for currently. I've just chosen a book. Um, so that's just uh, on me personally, where I had one class this semester, and so I had more time. And so I don't want to like half-ass it next semester by trying to um, get things into the intro class when it's one of two classes and I haven't taught either of them before. I think Kevin has a question for you, Michelle. Oh. Give it to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I texted it, but uh, I, 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 I missed it. Uh, what, what courses were you just teaching this last semester that you were just okay. describing? Yeah, it was the second semester um, calc based intro. So it was EM, um, circuits. We, did, uh, we had modern for the last month. Oh, good. Good. I'm, I'm especially interested in that because I'm about to teach 122 myself in the second quarter. So I've mm -hmm. got two sections of it this coming quarter. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm to hear what you, what you did. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have much. I, well, when we got to circuits, I didn't really think of anything um, really useful. So I just kind of stopped for that portion. And I was doing it um, in conjunction with the lab, um, which I don't know if that's the the best way to do it or not, but it's where I could find the time. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to share with you what I've done. Great, great. Because um, I, I don't know who's next, but since I'm talking, I'll, I, I actually, because mine's gonna be short, um, I just joined this group, you know, just a few weeks ago, the last uh, uh, AAPT meeting. And so uh, I haven't done anything this quarter, uh, but I'm looking for, you know, ways to, to start this upcoming quarter. And as I say, since I'm doing the second quarter e &M C, uh, cl class, that's what I'm looking for right now. Kevin, can you uh, maybe introduce yourself to the to the rest of the group? I'm not sure that we've we've all met you because some some of the folks here were at this summer workshop and and it sounds like you connected in a in a different way. Right. So um, obviously you can see my screen, uh, Kevin Wheelock. I'm at uh, Bellevue College in Bellevue, Washington, and uh, just a. Uh, a hop, skip, and a jump away from UW, and we're a, we're a feeder, uh, we're a two-year feeder college uh, for uh, University of Washington. So you got hooked in through the uh, the sectional meeting that Marie and Norm were at. Is that right? Uh, uh, are those the are those the names? Uh, 
I want to say, I want to say, Heidi, I'd have to look up, I'd have to look up the emails, but yeah, through, uh, yeah, through an AAP, a sectional uh, Washington State AAP meeting that was just about a month ago or so. Very cool. Uh, all right, so we will go from Kevin on my screen to uh, Rob. Am I unmuted? I'm unmuted. Okay. I, my touchpad is a little touchy or a little untouchy sometimes. Anyway, so this semester um, I did the uh, two intro courses, the calc-based and the not calc-based. I didn't really get to do anything much with the not calc-based. Um, with the calc-based, I expanded a little bit on what I've been doing with vPython for a while now. Um, had some success with that. Um, and then at the end of the semester, I decided to try a larger project. And I also gave them an opt out for that so that they could do a series of shorter exercises instead of doing the project. And they went about 50 50 on that. Um, the projects were pretty good considering it was the first time. And I actually gave them a pretty free hand with what they wanted to do. And the people that chose to do projects really wanted to work independently. So they were not particularly seeking out aid when it came time to actually put their projects together. Um, as far as what I'm doing in the springtime, I'm thinking I'm probably going to try a longer or more shorter things instead of the six longer things that I actually did this semester. So maybe one short thing a week instead of one longer thing every three weeks. But that's kind of where I'm at on, on my thinking with that. Um, Rob, I'll just ask, so how do you, how do you, how are you deciding to make changes in going from the longer to the shorter things? Like what, how are you making those decisions to, what are you, what are you chunking things into? Um, so what we did this semester, we did a lot of the um, sort of simulating things. So we were studying harmonic motion and we created some oscillators and we were studying planetary motion. So we, you know, created small systems and, and I have a whole series of exercises with that that I've been using for a while. So I've been piecing those things together in terms of application rather than um, sort of introductory theory. And I'm thinking that particularly for the second semester, some of those things like the field simulators and, and mappers and stuff might work really well sort of on the other end as the introductory piece instead of the summary piece. Hey, Rob, um, yeah. re remind me, you, you introduced the students, uh, this is their first experience with this, with uh, vPython, I believe, right? My first, my students' first experience, yes. Yeah, so you take them through from get, getting them started all the way through doing these things, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and we had pretty good success. I mean, there's, there's limitations and stuff. Mm -hmm. I started out trying to use notebooks and then I couldn't get the graphing function to work correctly in no, or to work at all really in notebook. Um, so I kind of abandoned that and, and moved on. Was, was that the Jupiter you're trying yeah. to use? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I still don't know what the solution to that is. Um, but I liked that there were aspects about the notebook that I really liked the way that it was able to, um, compress and, and, you know, introduce in a sort of step-by-step -step fashion, the, um, nearly working code or, or sort of minimal producing code and then work on modification off of that and so on and so forth. Um, but then I went back to the straight vPython when I couldn't get it to actually do what I wanted to do and didn't really have time to learn how to learn the other stuff well enough to teach it. I'm thinking if I have time in January, I'm going to try the, uh, the trinkets with the students. I did one trinket exercise with the student, um, the one that A.A. Ron had written over the summer. 
Um, and that actually worked pretty well as, as far as it went. There's a little bit of trick to that and that it doesn't seem to remember, it doesn't save. So I'm thinking there as well, at least, because every time they came back to it, um, through the web assigned into the trinket, it was reset to native status, which is what you'd want, I suppose. Um, but it made it kind of tough for them to finish it all in one setting. Rob, I was sort of curious about your comment that your students uh, really wanted to work um, independently. Uh, was that something you hadn't planned on, something that you pushed back on and kind of gave in on, or did that work well, or what? Uh, I, the, re I'm, the reason for my question is I'm, I'm anticipating a similar reaction, and uh, I'd, I'd like to have some clues as what's the you know, best practices way to respond. Well, I don't know. Um, it was not what I expected to happen. I expected them to spend a lot of time working with me pretty directly on the projects. And, um, and they just sort of went and ran with it. So I think if we had talked about it more as we went along, the end product would have been better. Um, but I'm not convinced that they would have gotten more out of it um, as opposed to working on it on their own and, and sort of running with it on their own. Do you have any sense of whether the students worked with each other? Uh, rather than with you? Yeah, actually, I did have them. I, I allowed them to work in small teams, and they all put themselves together in teams of two or three, the ones that actually went that route. And, and, and that's a good thing, and particularly with my students, because a decent chunk of my students are computer science students who are um, mostly trained in, like, C or C+, or one of the C versions. Um, so they have a somewhat different idea of the programming piece, and then they work sort of with, you know, somebody else. And um, in at least two of the cases, they were working with people that were more science-y oriented. But I had, out of six groups, I would say, um, a couple of them were, you know, one or two science students with a computer science student. And, and I had one case of two science students and one case of two CS students working together. Thanks, Rob. Okay. Um, so next on my uh, screen is Sean. Uh, so Sean, maybe you want to tell us a little bit about how things went this semester and what you have planned for the following? Yeah. Um, so I did uh, Trinket closed script exercises with my uh, intro mechanics class. And uh, I also taught upper level e &M. And the one uh, thing that I did with that was um, designing a, um, a lab with, uh, so they did a measure. So we, we just added a, a lab to our upper level courses. Uh, this is the first semester that we've had that. Um, so we, um, they had a, a where they were measuring the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, but that was uh, of dimensions where you actually had to do, um, you know, it, it it wasn't really like an infinite parallel plate capacitor. Uh, so designed a, a, a lab uh, using MATLAB where they um, solved uh, Laplace's equation um, using that. Uh, so that was like I taught them or introduced it in one lab session that didn't have a otherwise scheduled time. Uh, with the, the trinket in the uh, intro class, um, I think it, uh, it started out well and I, and I had them bring laptops to class and work on, on some exercises in class and then have homework exercises, but it kind of petered out especially, well, partly because um, you know, the stuff that I had designed was more focused on looking at um, kinematics type mm -hmm. things and forces. So once we hit energy, it was a, a little bit, uh, I didn't have as much material to, to work uh, that I had planned out. And then also just, uh, I got real busy with job applications and travel and things like that. Um, but I did bring in a few extra, you know, demonstrations in class of things. So like uh, one cool thing that I made just last week was uh, I learned about using a, an inverted pendulum as a model of, of walking. 
And so I coded a little walking guy. Uh, and so showed that in class after we did the, the derivation. Um, so next semester, um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to do much of, uh, in my intro class because I'm teaching the second semester of it, so the e &M, but it's going to be 63 students, which is a full, uh, literally full lecture hall for us. Um, so there's a little bit, it's a little bit harder for me to connect with each student in class and and so and the lab is you know doesn't have any computational components so i'm not sure that i would do anything there but i'm thinking of trying to do a little bit more in the statistical mechanics upper level class maybe uh uh do some sort of a longer term project uh with students so, so i'll say i run i ran i've run in the same kind of issues uh in introductory mechanics and moving from like forces in motion to energy and then to angular momentum in terms of, you know, finding the right sort of type of thing to have them do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if others have, have had that experience too, but it seems like the, the forces in motion, I, I have a very good sense of what I should have them work on. And then when I move beyond that, I get, I get a little stuck. I have exactly the same problem. Is there some place we could create a repository with, if people uh, come up with ideas and that way we're not all solving this, this same problem independently? I'm glad you said that, Kevin. So, <laughs> uh, so I think that the Slack team sort of app, uh, uh, is, is sort of a, a space for that. Um, there are channels there, uh, include, uh, so channels would be like chat rooms, if you will, and there is, there's a channel devoted to introductory mechanics. Um, so yeah, if, if folks have ideas, I, I would be certainly happy to post some of the things that we are doing with energy and angular momentum for folks. Um, but yeah, iterating on it in there and then sort of projecting it out would be fantastic. Um, I, I would be very on board with doing some thinking with folks, um, over the break. Um, uh, what's the status of the, um, the exercise sets on the website? Kelly, you want to take that one? Question. Yeah. Uh, we are beginning the uh, review process now. We've been on hold for about three months, to be honest. So we've got uh, all the editorial stuff in place, so you should be hearing soon. Yeah. Okay. So I meant, I meant to send out, well, this weekend I'm going to send out uh, a review. Uh, uh, nudge everybody that uh, be aware you're gonna something's gonna be coming down the pike. So, thanks for your patience on that, John, and everybody else. I I, I have to I have to ma make a confession. I uh, this semester about wiped me out. So that's that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. So, but we are back in the saddle and ready to roll. So stay tuned. All right. All right, so in my screen here, Josh, I think you're next. So, so how how things go this semester, and and what's it looking like for the next? Uh, things went well, um, as I discussed in our last video conference. I've been running uh, lab style seminars for introductory mechanics and uh, upper division uh, mathematical methods of physics. And these seminars meet two hours per week every week during the quarter. We have 10 week quarters uh, with the exception of a couple of weeks. And the material in the seminars ran somewhat parallel to the class material, but not exactly the same. And in each seminar, every student was paired up with another student and they would pair pairs code the entire time for two hours, basically using instructions that were written in a Jupyter notebook and with very little input from me. There's also a learning assistant walking around along with me, checking in with students, probing them and making sure they're, they're on task and answering their questions. And in the beginning, I felt like things were um, not working exactly as I'd hoped. There's sort of a bit of a learning curve when it comes to making collaborative work uh, collaborative coding work work properly 
But I found that especially when students got to know their partners better, it was really great. I mean, the discussions that people had were awesome. Um, I really love the, the pairs coding paradigm. I think I'm definitely gonna try to do it again. I found, for example, that when students are debugging their code, coding in pairs, you just get such much richer conversations about what the problems are with their code and what the solutions are, for example, or even richer discussions about the different prompts that I gave them in, in the Jupyter notebooks. Um, so I thought it worked really well. I have to say that I too am a bit wiped out primarily because of these seminars. It was significantly more work to prepare for them than I had expected. Uh, so it wasn't for the, it's not for the faint of heart running a coding lab. I will, I'll tell you that, especially developing all the material yourself in real time. But um, having done it, I think it was really rewarding. And for the next quarter, I'm going to be teaching two pretty large enrollment, like 200 per person student classes, one on introductory e and and the other one on like modern physics and optics and things like that. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to have, I don't think the energy to do this lab thing again uh, in, for two consecutive quarters, but I'm looking into a new avenue, which is kind of where I want to go in the future anyway, which is more organic integration of computation into those classes every week. Um, I'm going to explore trying to use trinkets to do that, and in particular, write reasonably easy problems that people with little coding experience could do uh, from week one, basically. Um, so my hope is to have maybe one problem every couple of weeks on the homework assignments that's a, that's a coding problem relating to the material and have it require them to interact with a trinket, a Python trinket. I have some questions for you. Um, so first, I think um, you were asked this on Slack, but you selected the pairs for your seminar, is that correct? And then they stayed with the same pairs throughout the whole semester for the same partner? Yeah, so um, originally I, I selected the pairs according to programming ability. In particular, I surveyed them before the seminars and asked them to rate themselves on their programming experience. And I paired one reasonably expert programmer with one reasonably novice programmer. But we actually found that uh, this caused some tension in certain groups in that um, some people really were so much better and faster than others that they just got super frustrated and didn't want to slow down to say, you know, explain something to their partner or whatnot. So we mixed the groups up a little bit to try to see if we could get some better matchings. And after we mixed them up, um, we stuck with those matchings for the entire quarter. And I at first was thinking of mixing them up every single time, um, just so people would get to have different perspectives. But we found that by getting to know each other, they got a really nice rapport and that their working process became really smooth. So I actually really liked the fact that uh, we just stuck with the pairs and then had them develop a relationship with each other and, and worked, they worked really well in teams after that. Okay, and um, so you said that the seminars were two hours per week. Was that two one hour sessions? It's two hours in a row. Okay. Once. Um, because I was trying to think for my computational physics class if it would be plausible to do like 20% of the class, like something lecture based, and then have the rest of the class be pair programming if they would be able to accomplish enough in that amount of time to make the, the pair programming useful. What do you think? Well, I guess that depends on what you want them to do, like how much content there is. But my experience has been that students are remarkably good at um, getting a lot done when their pairs coding. Uh, okay. more than I would, so enough that it, it became annoying to me because I had to make, create more material for them to do. So they actually completed things faster than if they were on their own. I think, I think it's hard to say because I haven't given the same material to people to do on their own. Um, but, it, but at least, I felt that they were doing things more com in a more complete way in the time that they did them. Mm -hmm. So it's efficient 
in my opinion. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, oh, people keep moving around here. So, uh, Sir Reg, I think you're, you would be next to share out. Um, yep, that looks right. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, so um, this semester um, I've been doing uh, intro physics, uh, calculus based physics, um, so mechanics. Um, we just, right now, on, uh, we did some thermodynamics oscillations. Uh, we're now on um, ideal gases, and that's where we'll end this semester. Um, and I've also been teaching the equivalent of um, computational physics, uh, sophomore level. Um, I haven't introduced anything, any programming in, um, in um, intro physics. My plan was to introduce something, and then I decided that it's best to wait until the second semester, where they'll do E&M, and um, I have a better idea of what I could do in E&M with, um, with the programming. Um, in computational physics, uh, um, our course is taught in the past has been taught uh, uh, only in C. Uh, but two of the two of my colleagues who were at the workshop in summer had decided that they want to introduce oh, some computation oh, in uh, upper level classical mechanics and another course. And so we decided that we will introduce, and they want to do it in in a Python, B Python. So we decided that we will introduce in addition to doing most of the um, computational physics in C, we would spend a couple of weeks um, on Python. So that's what I've done this semester, is um, incorporated a couple of weeks of Python in my um, computational physics course, which is largely C, um, just so that when they do get to um, classical mechanics, I think um, e either next semester or the semester after that, and they, they um, have projects to work on and, and be Python there. It wouldn't be the first time that they're seeing Python. Um, but I do have plans to, um, to incorporate some programming in the, in the um, second semester calc physics. That's it for me. Uh, when you did the Python, did you give them some basic code framework uh, for them to expand upon, or uh, or did you uh, well, yep. throw okay. them into the pond? Yeah. Uh, well, no, and <laughs> and no. Um, so how I how I do the course is we I have um, about thirty two students in the course. We are in a um, in a computer lab uh, on campus. So each student has a, a PC. Um, so they're sitting in front of a big monitor. They can. So I I. Ba I I introduce a topic, and I um, we proceed during the during the course of a, you know a fifty minute session to um, write some code to use the um, to um, explore the topic for the day. And typically, I would have um, um, not every class, but every second class, I would have um, a small sort of project for them to work on at the end. Um, so where they would have to write their own code. Usually it's, it's um, editing the code that we wrote during the class to, you, to do, use the new function that we introduced that day in a different scenario. So the code that they, the code that they would use for that would be code that they would have written um, along with me um, during the course of the class. Um, yeah, so for example, with Python, the, um, we just finished the two weeks of Python. The last day we were doing, and I used Jupyter Notebook, and it, was, it really made teaching this topic easier um, compared to C. We did um, chaotic maps. So we did the um, logistic map, um, and it was great because we could do the, make the, the graphs right there in Jupyter Notebook, whereas in C, you have, there's always an issue of what, how, do we, how do we plot the data file? Right, and in variable, somebody will pull up Excel or Origin or, or some obscure thing that I've never seen before and ask me to help make the graph. Um, so with Jupyter Notebook, we were able to write the code and make the graphs um, there and also you know, do all the nice things like zoom in, have a look at different parts of it. And then what they, were suppo what they did at the end of the class was um, 
you know, in about 15 minutes left, I gave them a function for the tent map and basically asked them, you know, all the features we just described, bifurcation, fractals, um, periods, um, chaotic regions. This is the function for the tent map. See if you can identify all, make the graphs and uh, see if you can identify all the regions. So what they had to do was take the, the, the code that we had just developed for the logistic map and now just apply it to a different um, function, which is not as simple as just swapping out the functions. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what I did. Our computational physics is three, we meet three times per week for 50 minutes at a time. Very Great, cool. thank you. All right, uh, I think next in my panel here is Chuck. Um, Chuck, would you mind introducing yourself to the rest of the group, uh, mainly because I don't know you? Um, well, I was at the uh, AAPT meeting uh, uh, back in October, and uh, I just started learning about all this pickup uh, stuff, and I got on the Slack channel, and I've been really excited to try and implement this in my class. Um, I haven't actually done it yet, because it was we were part of the way through the quarter, but um, I did convince a couple of uh, engineering instructors to tr to implement some of the uh, some of the uh, pickup exercises uh, in their engineering class because we have a couple of classes where we teach students how to basically model things in Excel and then later model things in MATLAB. So we're going to have them use the I think the harmonic oscillator one. Uh, we're going to have them uh, model it in Excel and then we're going to have them in the next class model it in MATLAB and hopefully they'll see what the power of that is. So uh, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm just kind of hoping to listen to you guys and how do you how you do it, so I can you know start to implement this in my physics classes as well. And where are you where are you teaching at, Chuck? Sorry. Oh, uh, I'm teaching at Edmonds Community College in uh, in uh, Seattle. Chuck, I forgot who did the workshop with you. Was it Marie and? Uh... It should have been Marie and Norman because I, I didn't go to that one. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was Marie. Okay. Marie and Norman. Right, right. Oh, good to have you, Chuck. Yeah, hi. Sean, you get to go again. No, uh, Hunter is uh, next on my list here. So Hunter, we're talking about, uh, you're probably picking it up here, how things went this semester and what are some plans for next semester? Okay, well, um, I tried a, a variety of things. I don't, uh, I think I'm pretty much, I don't have any real news since our last meeting, but I know not everybody here was there. Um, I tried trinkets in my uh, sophomore level waves and heat introductory calculus based class. And I had a laptop cart that I pulled into the lecture hall and had them check out laptops and um, pull up trinkets on uh, through our learning management system. And either they had to, you know, either the trinket worked and they had to modify some parameters or it didn't work and they had to enter some formulas to get it to work. Um, I like that okay, um, except for the fact that we have to wheel in the laptops. But, you know, eventually if we have, if we can reliably provide computing resources, I'd like to be able to have lots of trinkets to go with uh, whatever it is that they're doing, especially if what they're doing is perceived as, um, you know, less rigorous because of its, conceptual nature, which I don't think is less rigorous, but I think the students can perceive it that way. So I think computers help to give it some numbers and some, you know, more of a geekier feel. Um, and uh, in my quantum class, uh, we've been using Jupyter Notebooks some, and mostly just trying to, um, you know, there, I didn't quite have the nerve to give them design scenarios as much as I did I want to give them, you know, a program that I wrote that, um, you know, didn't have the, didn't have the probability density or something. And then I wanted them to add that, you know, just to enhance it a little bit because we still, you know, at Texas state, we still don't have a formal, formal support for them to learn the Python, but which we're going to, we're going to start that next fall. We're going to have a lab course for sophomores where all of the physics majors and minors are going to take that. Um, I also had a, a group, a small working group of students that were doing an independent study with me and we worked through um, Kinder and Nelson, uh, Python for physical modeling, and then also some problems in 
Newman's computational physics book. Um, and, you know, at the end, they're sort of tried to reflect on what will be good experiences for this sophomore course that's starting next fall. We've also got um, a couple of students that I'm doing research with where we're right now we've been developing a, a visual editor, a block, drag and drop blocks editor for vPython um, GlowScript. And um, so we're now kind of trying to form partnerships with a computer science professor. Well, let's see, there's, UT Austin has money from the state. It's called, for a project called We Teach CS, and they want to increase the number of computer science teaching certifications. So we're going to get involved in that, and the idea is to get some, get some teachers in math and physics or whatever to cross over and add CS as a certification uh, through 60 hours of PD that we're going to put on. So, so the computer science professor that we know saw our work on the blocks and the trinkets and stuff and thought it was pretty cool and wanted to include us. So we're going to be teaching teachers pretty soon something. I don't know exactly what. Um, and then we're also meeting with the, um, this, on Thursday we're meeting with the CEO of Trinket to talk about doing a curriculum partnership. And I don't know exactly what that means, but it's the name of a thing on their website, curriculum partnerships, and we're gonna meet him and see what can be done. Very cool. Uh, oh, and also, I gotta say, just for fun, um, we visited Continuum Analytics in November, uh, where Anaconda is from, that's Austin on 6th and Lavaca or something, so. We went there and, and met Travis Hall, the of NumPy, and that was pretty fun. That's it. Hunter, the, the fellow that you're meeting, or I assume it's a guy because it's a technology, that's, that's sexist, sorry. Uh, is it Brian Marks? No, it is Elliot Hauser. Okay. And he has a beard. He or she has a big beard. Yeah, so Brian Marks used to have a big wizard beard. He worked at uh, WebAssign and now is he's he's a chief something officer at Trinket. Maybe he's the technology officer. Okay. But he had, okay. yeah, I, I don't know. Or lead Probably doesn't remember team. me, but if you see him, say hi and, and, well, don't stroke the wizard beard, but admire it. Well, this is going to be a video meeting. You'd so still admire the wizard beard. If there's a beard stroking emoji, I won't press it. Or no, I will press it. All right. I'm glad uh, we're re I'm glad we're recording this. I can't wait till Norman sees this. Oh yeah, this will be this will be great. Yeah, get ready. I actually have a question, Hunter. Um, you yes. said you had used uh, Kinder and Nelson and and the bit of Newman's book. Um, wh what what did you find the main differences to be that are salient and like which which do you prefer for what sorts of things? If oh any? well, it's a very different experience. Um, Newman is full of problems, full of problems, application problems that, um, that relate to this or that physical scenario. So it's, you know, at the end of each chapter, you're applying some computational concepts to a wide variety of physical scenarios. So it's really has a feeling of a senior level elective course, you know, where you've seen all these, you, you know what black body radiation is, you know what, Lagrange point is, you know, whereas in Kinder and Nelson, it's very light on physics and, and good for, I think, and it's, it's definitely introductory. And it's, and it's, so I think it's going to be good for a sophomore level, level course. Um, I also got on the recommendation of one of those students in my group. Um, hang on a sec. So uh, this is a book that one of my students got who felt like she couldn't really keep up with the math in Newman. Um, and so, you know, it's, it was, had a lot of positive reviews. And so I'm just going to look at it and see if this would be another good sophomore level uh, thing where there's math that you know, you know, and then you're just learning the Python to, you know, the math is sort of comfortingly familiar, but uh, it doesn't look too simple. You know, so I'm not worried about it. 
Who's Sorry, the who's the author for that one? Yeah. What's that? The author is Amit Saha. Let's paste it in the Slack channel, y'all. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Hunter? All right, well, we will move over to, let me make sure I've gone through this. Uh, Tony, uh, so we're just sharing out uh, how things went this semester and what's the plan for next semester. You need to unmute mute yourself. Okay, there you go. Can you hear me? Yeah, so I was saying, I don't know how things went exactly, but uh, uh, I had shared what we, what I had done with my students earlier on. Oh, Chuck and Kevin, my name is Tony and I teach at BSC. I, I just forgot to introduce myself. I teach two, at a two-year college, so primarily uh, university physics and college physics, which is uh, the stuff that scientists and engineers uh, take for uh, introductory physics. So I use vPython and I, I doubled in, uh, what's, I've even forgotten his name. Uh, what's the, GlowScript, uh, Tony? GlowScript, yeah. Uh, so I didn't really have a very good experience with GlowScript. Uh, I guess I should have doubled with it a lot more. Um, so I, I went back to vPython and just used vPython for uh, the rest of the semester. Tony, what are you saying you should have done? Well, I should have kind of uh, worked more with it because I had some problems that were basic uh, and they frustrated my students. So I just went back to what I knew, you know. Uh, so I, I probably need to work more using GlowScript. But vPython worked fine for me, so it wasn't a problem. Uh, I have a little girl here who wants to show her face. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so uh, next semester I'm planning on continuing with vPython uh, with uh, ENM. And so I just use the traditional matter and interactions, uh, which has nowadays has scaffolding. So it has the vPython in the book itself. Uh, though my students really don't use it. Uh, I, I do have exercises that I give them where they do computing in the lab and they also do experimental labs. Hey. <laughs> so that's about all. I mean, do you guys have questions for Terry? I wanna know what, what went wrong with your glow script. No, it wasn't really that it went wrong. It's just that I was uncomfortable with it and my students were also uncomfortable because I, I used vPython and then went back to, uh, and, and then said, told them that, well, GlowScript is better because you can save your programs there. And I think I had an issue with an, an operating system. And then I had an issue with just not... Uh, it was a it was a formatting issue, or uh, uh, and then it just spiraled into a problem that students kind of became like GlowScript. We don't want to deal with GlowScript because it has too many issues. I can't debug well, uh, so it wasn't really a major problem. I agree with you. It's yeah, the, the debugging is almost non-existent. Yeah, but I still like the idea that uh, your programs are right there, so. That's great. So, Tony, one thing that we had talked about, I mean, I don't know if it was, it might not have been you and I, but it might have been the broader group at some point, was um, trying to develop some tutorials for faculty around sort of the major, you know, platforms that people are using, whether it's something like GlowScript or, you know, how do I use Trinket or how do I use Jupyter Notebooks? Um, mm -hmm. Do you think that that, like, if that kind of thing were available to you, it would be something that would be helpful in sort of navigating a new environment? Like, is that something we should be thinking about? 
Absolutely. I think it will be very helpful for me. Uh, once I get into the semester, I'm usually drowned. In fact, right now I'm just setting a, an exam here. <laughs> so, yeah, summer is usually great for me, but after I get into uh, fall and spring, yeah, there's, there's just nothing. No time to do anything. So that would really be helpful. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's something we've we've talked about. I mean, Kelly and I and the and the rest of the leadership group, and it's um, so we we can we can think about that a little more. Yeah. Okay. I yeah. Think I got a quick general question about GlowScript. I I have not not yet delved into this a bit. Um, uh, Rob, you still use VPython, don't you? Oops, can you guys, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, yeah, okay. I, I've got having difficulty unmuting myself. Oh, yes, that's okay. Python. Well, I just right. wonder, because Hunter, Python again. yeah, well, Hunter, Hunter said there's some, uh, I, I don't know, uh, some uh, glitches or something. Is that true of, of this Glow script in general? The error messages are very poor quality. That's, I mean, uh, okay. uh, but, but so what I do now is I, um, I try to build in Spider. I mean, except that Spider doesn't have access to the Python, but um, I, mm -hmm. I make other kinds of errors, and Spider mm -hmm. can help me with that. And Jupyter can also has better. Jupyter has pretty good error feedback, mm -hmm. so I'll develop in there. But mm -hmm. I mean, now, frankly, now I make fewer errors, and so I'm able to mm -hmm. develop in in Trinket okay. um, just fine. I I think it was. So Steve Wolf was in this meeting last time, I think, and he said that that since this summer, Trinket. So it, I think at the um, at the time of our workshop this summer, Trinket mm -hmm. was using GlowScript, and then GlowScript were providing different uh, errors, uh, error feedback. But then, you know, as a request sent to Trinket, then Trinket was just uh, you displaying the error feedback that GlowScript was giving. But still, they're both not helpful, and they're not even Python errors; they're JavaScript errors, I think. Yeah. Um, so, you you need to develop in a different environment, and then yeah. okay. and then port it over, or or just know, have a higher level of facility that you can catch your own. Mm -hmm. I was just curious what, how that was going. I I don't know. I suppose Aaron is very much aware of all of this. I guess. Aaron Titus. Yeah. 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 Okay, that's all, I'm I, just curious. I don't use, um, I guess part of how I debug is, I don't know, it's a little, it's a little advantage where Trinket has the code uh, and the output side by side, whereas the GlowScript website has you toggling back and forth between mm -hmm. your code and your output. So the GlowScript website to me is dead, except for the documentation mm. where I go occasionally. Yeah. But I just, I just do all my GlowScript work in Trinket. Okay, that's good to know. Hunter, um, have you tried using any of these things within Jupyter Notebooks with any success? Any of which things? Like vPython, for example? Yes, yeah, so like if, you know, in for the quantum uh, simulations that I've done, I, I needed to use NumPy and uh, at least NumPy. Uh, together with vPython, and and as far as I know, if you want to use any, you know, uh, popular Python libraries and vPython together, it has to be Jupyter, or or the old classic vPython. But I don't want to use that anymore. I don't want to touch it. Did you find that that was reasonably easy to implement? Ju Jupyter. Uh, vPython in Jupyter notebooks, yeah. Um, well, I had some difficulties back in September that are documented on the, on Slack, um, where I was, I managed to, to get, uh, Danny in real time one day and, and Larry was chiming in too. And it was a matter of making, I didn't understand about WebGL being activated in the browser and, um, also didn't know how to make sure I had the latest version of everything or didn't know how to, you know, I, I now have a, 
a better understanding of how to probe the computational system that's in front of me to, under, to understand what, um, what libraries are active or what, you know, what version of Python I'm using. And so it's easier to diagnose because I know some sort of key tidbits, you know, for diagnosis. And then I, and then I got the systems up and working and then they work. And then could I, could I fix a broken system? Maybe not, you know, maybe, maybe not. Did you get, um, did you ever try mouse interactions in vPython in Jupyter Notebooks? I think that's the only thing that I couldn't get working, but I could get working in Trinket. What kind, what, oh, mouse interactions. No, I never, I never tried that. Okay. Uh, I think Michelle, uh, just as a, a technical question or technical answer, um, the way that the canvas is drawn in a Jupyter notebook is different from the way that it is drawn when you when you use something like GlowScript or you use something like VPython. I mean, it's not a canvas in that case, but um, uh, I there there seems to be a it seems to be slightly problematic when you go to get a redraw. Like when you when you request uh -huh. a redraw, um, and so I noticed with working with my students because when I was I was teaching upper level you know the semester and we did Jupyter notebooks and sometimes we did D Python. Um, if they made a mistake with where the canvas statement was, um, redrawing their whatever it was that they were doing uh, became problematic and they had to kill the kernel and start it over again and we had to figure out where it had to be. So I think it's it's um it's a it's a problem that Bruce is aware of, but I'm not sure that he knows how to solve it. Okay, to, so are you saying that you have you have gotten mouse interactions to work in? Nope. Okay, because no, it was my understanding that people have gotten it to work like on the internet, <laughs> but I haven't met any of these people. <laughs> okay. My, my sense is it has to do with the way that the canvas gets drawn and redrawn. Um, okay. And that that is that is not um, the bugs aren't fully out of that. Okay, thanks. Hey, Danny, the, um, we don't use a canvas statement at all in Jupyter, but we do have to restart the kernel every time we restart. We run the program. If you use the canvas statement, you won't have to. Really? Yeah. Usually, yeah. Not not all usually. the time. Not all the time. Usually. <laughs> Can you can you uh, write down what that statement is so that we can save ourselves some? Time? Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll um, I'll put a note to myself to to post something that has the statement in it uh, somewhere. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe our last participant who hasn't shared yet is uh, I think it's Deep Sheik. Uh, is that right? Is that who DS one six seven? Yes. Yes. <laughs> ah, there we go. All right. So. Uh, so. Yeah, I basically um, had simpler programs embedded in my lab section to go concurrently with lab as an alternate means um, to look at the same things. And it was mainly force and motion, like position, velocity, acceleration, force, uh, of dyna dynamics, uh, or projectile motion, or uh, collisions even. But I think by and large, they went well, but there were a few students that uh, probably struggled more than the others because they did not have a computational background. But uh, since it was a lab setting, uh, they worked in groups. So in the end, it did not matter that much. They could, you know, teach each other and help each other. And I was, uh, and I don't have a really big class, so that's, that's good. Uh, in fact, what I was able to do was I was teaching algebra-based as well as uh, calculus-based intro mechanics. Um, and I was able to, well, one plus point of not using Mataran interactions this semester was that I was able to use the similar computational uh, sort, sort of programs for both uh, classes. Since they were embedded with the lab, I could I could do that with both simultaneously. So that was the plus point. Uh, next semester, what I'm thinking is um, this semester it felt more like bits and pieces. Uh, it was 
it was a strain on me as as with all of you so next semester what i'm thinking is when i teach enm um, i'd go with a combination of lab as well as uh, what josh suggested i guess um, include at least one homework computational homework problem with every set that way they are uh, continually thinking about it rather than when i give a computational piece in the lab that's when they think about it and then forget about it so i guess repetition would be what i would be looking for next semester cool uh, any follow up questions for uh, dipshika okay well i'm i'm sensitive of the time and i'm i'm glad everyone got to share out if if people have just a few more minutes i wanted to just kind of ask more broadly and and people can jump in as they as they feel um are there things that that we, uh, as either uh, you know the sort of leadership council or or pick up more broadly, could could help uh, do or help facilitate, um, you know, as far as as incorporating computing uh, in your in your courses, helping you to do that? Are there things that we can we can provide support for or 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 sort of organize the community around? Posting a troubleshooting document. <laughs> Uh, it occurs to me that if there's sort of a one-stop shop for students to get documentation on coding, I mean, obviously, you know, a little Googling will find you anything on anything, but uh, if we had something we could put in our syllabus that points them at, that uh, they want to find out how to do this in vPython or do that in a regular Python or so on, that might be useful. I know we focused a lot on implementing computation in, in the curriculum, but I'm at a point with my department that I'm trying to push for more computation broadly in the department. And I'd find it useful to have resources that facilitate that for me. In particular, um, for example, if I'm in some sort of academic affairs committee meeting, it would be nice to have a list of what other institutions are doing with computation. So I can take that list to them and say, look, like, you know, I'm not alone in wanting to do this stuff. There are a lot of institutions doing this. And uh, we should be considering this too, for example, or any other resources you can think of as a means of motivating administrators to give this attention. Uh, J uh, Josh, it's interesting you bring that up. You are now, well, we have been contacted directly by three other places very recently. Um, I guess one of the reasons if you type into Google computation, education, that sort of thing, we come up, right? Pickup comes up. Um, and so uh, there's Syracuse is one. Uh, University of Minnesota is another one who are at the state that you're describing here. Uh, and they're asking about pretty much the same thing, departmental level resources to uh, not just what to do, but to, to help convince colleagues and administrators. So we're definitely putting this on the list. And uh, I think maybe, Danny, we can create another channel on uh, Slack with this. Uh, at very least that, but I but I think we'll we'll make a a broader effort towards creating resources for this. I don't know um, what form it'll take yet, but but that's on our radar. I was wondering just along these lines too, if pickup leadership would be willing to say give talks either by video conference or fly out to convince departments to do things. Sure. Josh, I'll go to LA anytime. <laughs> I hear they have good food. Uh, <laughs> Weather's not bad. Uh, so, so Josh, the answer is yes. Uh, so, I just did this very thing at Illinois Wesleyan this last week. Uh, the guy went and gave a talk and tried to do some convincing. I call it evangelism, I guess. Um, so, I think that any of us uh, in not uh, you, you don't. This doesn't have to be the pickup leadership. I think, uh, you know, a lot of you can articulate as well as I can. So uh, I think if there's a need, we can we can meet it if it's if it becomes well defined enough. I think you'll have enough uh, willingness to chip in and do whatever 
whatever it takes. So, so one but thing, I think in an official, we'll, we'll, we'll try to develop more materials along these lines. So along these lines, one thing that I would find useful is if we had a document that we all collaboratively agree on, where this is kind of a response to the AAPT and APS's declaration that computation is important. Um, so something where we are saying, you know, we provide, we now are providing this resource for physics professors in response to these. Excellent idea. Kelly, uh, I mean, I, since we're spitballing here, what about a, um, what about something that's like an editorial for physics today that um, the community, the broad, broader pickup community now um, drafts? Right, um, that highlights sort of resources and so forth. I mean, maybe not, maybe not right now, but in the yeah, yeah, next yeah. couple of years, as yeah. we're saying, like there is, there are people, lots of people behind this doing lots of different things, right. and there are resources out there, right. and the department should right. be aware of it. And we can, we can have some. I mean, we can have some of the survey data can be highlighted in there. And so yeah, kind of, definitely. Kind of like a broad sort of discussion of the whole effort. Um, you know, with with yeah. uh, the with the usual high energy physics author list. Is the new survey data available? It is not, Rob. We have just closed the survey, as I understand it, and we are just beginning um, the analysis. And by we, I mean the AIP. Um, back to the, the the question of resources, real quick. And I think Kevin, you had mentioned a. Uh, central repository of resources. Um, we are, we have our web developer back in the saddle. And uh, by the way, Sean, part of, part of the hiatus on those exercise sets is we haven't had our, our website developer back with us for, for quite a while, but we're, we're ready to roll now back, especially the first week in, in, in January. The reason I'm bringing this up is we're going to be spending over the next, uh, semester, um, a lot of effort in, in thinking about what goes under that resources tab on the pickup website. And um, maybe we should have maybe one of these or a series of these types of meetings to talk a little bit more in depth about that, uh, because it's only going to be successful if we all contribute to it. I mean, you, you know, I, I, you know, I and Larry and Danny and we, you know, for the, for those of us who really like to do this thing, we can get stuff created and put it up there. But uh, it's really all of you contributing and being a part of it. So I, I want to not only welcome you, but urge you to, uh, if you have you know great ideas of things that should, that, that should go up there, um, and anything's game as far as I'm concerned. One thing, let me just give you a quick example at our, at our workshop last uh, summer, our, developers workshop uh, Ernie Beringer who I think you some of you know if not we can introduce him but uh, he, uh, he 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 made a point you'll like this one Rob that he he, he says he, he's a novice guitar player and uh, I think he's a little better than novice he's a humble man but he he, uh, he says anytime he wants to learn a new song he goes to Google and types in the name of the song and guitar lesson and there it pops up and he thought wouldn't that be great to be able to do that and have a nice you know not not a not a somebody giving a lecture on the Euler method, for instance, but just a quick 30 second idea to give you the essence of what that's all about, right? And so these, these are the kinds of things I think would be unique and uh, uh, very usable for people in general uh, who, would, who would wander on our site or would want a, a, a resources of these kinds of things. And, and that's just a simple example, so. Kelly, I think you've suggested uh, what's a really good next meeting for us, uh, maybe late January, early February meeting, and, and I'll, I'll get a poll going out for folks, which right. is to talk about uh, and brainstorm sort of resources. So sort of combination video meeting and maybe a open Google document for all of us to take notes in and, uh, and get a sense of what that resources page should look like, what should live on it. And, uh, and then maybe, you know, the, the following meeting starting to try to assign maybe some responsibility and get people to lend their own expertise to it. Um, yeah. You know, because people have been doing lots of different things from what I've heard over the last two meetings. Um, yeah. How do folks feel about that? Does that sound like a, like a interesting shift instead of, you know, 
Okay. And this is all, you know, this isn't just the pickup leadership thing. This is your, this is your thing too. This is, this is your ownership. We want to, okay, this, this could be as cool as we make it. Go ahead, Hunter. No, I was just going to say that uh, I, I feel, you know, I, I think a lot of us feel like we're included, you know, we're not, I don't, I don't think we're trying to pass the buck to you, you know, to do something. Mm -hmm. um, In fact, I, I plan to seize power relatively. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you then you're going to appoint all of your own people. <laughs> well, this way I don't, don't have to spend so much time writing the next grant. So, <laughs> well, as, as a newbie, maybe I can uh, help confuse things even more. Uh, and uh, the particular resource that I uh, am familiar with uh, is Sage and Sage Cloud. And uh -huh. I'm never, I've seen a review. Not a, one of the things I discovered recently is that it uh, is is a it's a very good uh, environment for coding in, in straight Python. Uh -huh. And it supports NumPy and SciPy and, uh, and Mat Matplotlib, and you can make nice, you know, cool uh, graphs and, and even animations. So that's, that's, uh, that's another alternative for as far as uh, Python coding is. And, and along with, I guess you're already familiar with it, it's, it, it's um, uh, algebraic computational uh, facilities. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually what I use for the seminars, Kevin, also. Yeah, I use that in uh, P for Python in uh, my computational physics class because uh, we didn't get anything installed on the computers in the computer lab in time. So that, that was a use, really useful for us. Well, that being the case then, uh, I, I'm not sure about the, the, the Jupyter uh, notebook interface because I've used the classic interface with Sage but you can publish your workbooks. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they're not interactive of course, but uh, you know, we talk about sharing stuff with each other and that's a way to do it and just share links around. And, and I, I've got, I run my own Sage server uh, off my own web servers as it happens. And I've got a number of things published there. So. Great. Um, all right. So I, I want to make sure I'm respectful of folks time. It's, it's now uh, uh, 913 at least uh, here on the, well, the best coast, third coast. Um, <laughs> your, your invitation has been rescinded. You know what? We got the most fresh water, so there. Lansing's um, not by any water. That's right. <laughs> we'll never have a drought. Um, anyway, uh, so I want to thank you all for, for joining us. I, I really appreciate you all sharing and, and, and the conversation. <laughs> and, and I'm really looking forward to, to, the, uh, to the next meeting. Yeah. Um, I think we're, we're starting to sort of coalesce around some stuff that's going to yeah. really support this, this community and, and grow it out and, and really try to get other folks involved. So I really appreciate that. Um, so I'll, I will be in touch. Um, cause it looks like I'm the, the de facto organizer here, Kelly, which is great for me. Um, so, uh, we'll try to get something on the schedule as, as long as, um, I'll, I'll send a poll out to make sure that sort of Tuesday evening still work for folks in the spring. And then we'll try to schedule something late January, early February. Um, but I'll probably send that out um, after the, the first of the year so that folks have some time to decompress after the semester. And it's Monday. <laughs> What's that? Monday. That's okay. Daddy doesn't know what day it is sometimes. What it's, day? Is, is it Monday? Monday. <laughs> <laughs> oh that was oh well <laughs> and if, if you go tuesdays you'll lose me no no we'll stick with monday yeah <laughs> we, we don't want to lose anybody <laughs> we'll stick with mondays i don't know why i thought it was tuesday no i know why <laughs> anyway i wanted it to be tuesday right yeah All right. folks well have a good uh finals week if it's finals week for you or have a good break if it's already break for you so uh and have yeah. a good vacation. Happy right. Holy Day. Hey. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. Nice to meet you, folks. So, yeah.